On today's podcast from the archives, we're joined by Joe Ashfield from Rice University. Joe played quarterback in college, but made the the transition to being an offensive line coach. And a lot of what he talks about, his teaching really comes through, and he talks about how they install a power running game, as well as some of the techniques that he likes to use. Keep tuning into the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. We have new episodes coming next week. We also have our new digital magazine launching, Coaching Coordinator Monthly, where we give you some extra content from the podcast that is free to coaches, and we'll be having more news released about that as the week goes on. Enjoy the podcast. I'm excited to be joined today by the offensive line coach at Rice, Joe Ashfield. Joe, it's, it's great to have you here on the podcast. No, it's great to be here, Keith, and thanks for having me on. So, Coach, before we get into some of the specifics of, of offensive line play and some of the things you do to build your units, I definitely want to touch on your, your background in, in both college football as, as a player. You had the opportunity to play for the legendary John Gallardi at St. John's in Minnesota. You were quarterback there. You went on to play a little bit in Europe and then New Zealand, and then you got bit by the coaching bug, I guess, and, and now you've been coaching since 2004, about 14 years. 14 years is, is pretty young in this profession still. So while you definitely have some experience in this, I'm sure you're still learning along the way. But Coach, talk to us a little bit about that journey and I guess start off with, for you, what was it that, when was it that you realized you wanted to be a football coach? Oh, man. It, and the, the genesis probably happened when I was a kid. Like a lot of guys, my dad was my first coach. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting with him, and when he was my coach in Peewee football, drawing up plays on a yellow legal pad and, and my trying to do that. And I was always interested in, in the game and the mechanics of it. And, the team and, and then I think when I – my last semester of college, when I was student teaching at a high school in my home state of Minnesota – I got to luckily was assigned to a school where the head coach is a guy named Dave Nelson, who's sort of a dean of high school coaches in, in Minnesota now. And he allowed me to help coach the varsity team as a, an assistant defensive backs coach. And it just, just, I knew I'd love it. And, and I really fulfilled all of that for me. I knew I, I, I love the game and I love working with guys and just, just solidified that this is really what I wanted to do. So uh, having before that, I, as you mentioned, I played for Coach Gallardi, and I actually went to two different universities. I played for Rob Ash at Drake University. I think Rob's been on your podcast yeah. talking about his analytics things he's doing now. And those both of those guys are great examples and very different examples. If you know anything about Coach Gallardi, and, and watching taking a lot from Coach Gallardi and, and being around him, but I've also learned don't try to be like John. And John's a very different guy, and his system works because of who he is. And so people ask me a lot, what did you take from Coach Gallardi? And it was, don't try to be him. <laughs> <laughs> his system works because of who he is. But from there, after I, I was a student teacher, I decided I wanted to try to become a GA and, and search the Internet. This was in 2001 and found the German League and thought that'd be pretty fun to go over and play. I spoke a little German, so I ended up being lucky enough to play a team in, in Germany in a town called Schwäbisch Hall. And that's really where the coaching bug really bit. I decided in the middle of that that if somebody wanted to pay me to fly around the world and play football, I'd want to do it. And I knew I wanted to get more into coaching, so I wanted to find a a lesser developed country than Germany as far as the game of football is concerned. So I looked on the Internet and thought, I've always wanted to go to Australia. Let's see if there's teams there. Well, in that search, I found some teams in New Zealand. I said, boy, that's just as good. Put out some feelers to a bunch of teams and – Luckily enough, uh, caught on with the team in Auckland, New Zealand, and went there as their supposedly their offensive coordinator. But after putting in a very basic passing tree in the first practice, the director of the club said, well, you're the head coach. <laughs> and so I just thrown right into the fire. I went down there with a high school buddy of mine and ended up staying there three years. I really loved it, and it was a great opportunity for me and sort of a consequence-free environment coaching-wise to make a lot of mistakes. And what I really learned there wasn't so much football was but coaching people, I had guys on my team, uh, they all had jobs. The youngest was 17, the oldest is 47. So there was a wide range of, of guys that coach, and, and I screwed up a lot. I, I ran some people off because I was young and stupid and 
<laughs> probably made some bad decisions in how I, I ran practices and, and treated some people, but I learned. And I got the opportunity after that to go to Delta State University in Mississippi, thanks to head coach Rick Rhodes, who had come down to New Zealand to do a clinic. So I came back and became a GA in 2004 at Delta State. And that's really where I got into offensive line. I GA for a guy named Joel Williams, who's back at Delta State now as their offensive coordinator. And then when Coach Williams left, that's really why I met Coach Bloomberg, who's now the head coach at Rice. So he and I worked together for a semester. And then I moved on and went different places. He and I coincidentally kind of ended up at Stanford at different times. And when he ended up being the offensive coordinator at Stanford, we got in touch. And he asked if I'd like to go back to Stanford to work for him again and jumped at that chance. So I spent the last five years with him. He's kind of been my mentor as an offensive line coach. And we're really proud of the things we were able to accomplish there and, and hoping to accomplish similar things now at Rice. Coach, when you go back to your, your days at St. John and playing for Coach Gillardi and for anybody who's read about him at the time, I, I remember reading articles or seeing things, maybe short videos about him on on like ESPN or stuff like that. I mean, he was in a lot of ways ahead of his time. When you look at the idea of not doing a whole lot of hitting in practice, I mean, that's what everybody's doing today. We try to keep contact out of practice unless it's absolutely necessary for teaching. We're smart about how we practice and do things, and that was just a big part of, of what he did. And at the time, it was it was distinctly different from what everybody else was doing. What was it for you as, as a player, I guess maybe coming from high school where it was a little bit different and then than playing for mm-hmm. Coach Gallardi and playing in that system there? Well, I would say John's system and his style – was the extreme example of taking away anything that wasn't absolutely necessary to play in the game of football. Mm-hmm. The practices at St. John's were about an hour and a half a team and just rapid fire. Two huddles going, two offensive huddles going, and the defense getting up there and playing the scout team and an hour and a half of just running plays. So the number of reps that you got, whether at any position, was, was more than any other practice I've ever been around. People talk a lot about there's no hitting in practice. And that wasn't necessarily true. It was, it was mostly what I think most ter- coaches would term thud. Right. These days, there was a little bit of bang, but no going to the ground, no tackling. We didn't even own practice pants, I don't believe. <laughs> so it was always shells. But that, John's the ultimate player coach, and that stemmed from, from the fact that he really started coaching at the age of 16 when his high school coach went off to the military. And they had nobody left, and he was the captain of the team, and he convinced the – I think it was the principal of the Monsignor at his, at his high school to let him try to coach and see what happened. And so when he went out to practice, he asked the guys, well, you guys want to do calisthenics? Nah, you guys want to, didn't he want to tackle? And he didn't want guys to get hurt. They didn't have that many players. And, and later that turned, he kind of has a joke that, well, the other guys, it's not just the quarterback that has a mother, everybody else has two. We don't want to get them hurt in practice. So John's a funny guy that way, but it was really an extreme example of let's take away all the unnecessary junk that doesn't that doesn't really translate directly into playing a football game and so that's one of the biggest things I learned from him was to examine what I'm doing in practice and just how well does this simulate what I'm trying to teach and if my drill isn't a very good simulation of what I want to happen in a game then I probably need to figure out a better way to do the drill or find another drill you you mentioned that coach became essentially a player coach and that's what you had the opportunity mm-hmm. to do overseas. Mm-hmm. I, and I, I find that to be true with a lot of guys. I've had players go on to play in a number of different places. I actually had a, a quarterback who graduated for me in 2009, just ended his playing career. And uh, he, he wrote a book about the experience that he titled, Have You Tried Working? Because for him, it was <laughs> he was over there. And it was just, I mean, it was He's making money doing it and making a living and yeah. making great relationships across the world. His initial goal was he wanted to play on every continent, but then I think he fell in love with a city and a team he was with in Slovenia and ended up being mm-hmm. there the last part of his, his playing and coaching career. But immediately he went from being a college player to being the quarterback, and then and because of how much he knew about the game, more than them, he became the offensive coordinator as well. So he was calling his own plays, putting in his own offense, and I remember 
distinctly remember every year you call me up, coach, what do you got? What can we do this year? Here's yeah. what I'm looking to do. And I think it's a, it's, it's a different way of getting into coaching, but for those guys who don't mind getting away from home and graduate college. And I always told them like, Anthony, don't buy a car. Don't get a girlfriend right <laughs> now. Don't go get an apartment, like live this dream as long as you want. But as soon yeah. as you get something that nails you down, you're going to find a reason that you have to give it up. And so I guess he took that advice to a T. <laughs> yeah, that's, it is a different path going over there, but it was really rewarding for me. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I have a guy that played for me at when I was at Alphonse Square in New Mexico Military Institute, my quarterback. He's now over there playing. Sounds like he's playing in the same league as, as your former quarterback, I'm, I'm pretty sure. But he's same thing called me up. Hey, coach, do you still have our own stuff? And, and the stuff you taught me, do you have anything written down about that? Because I've, I've got to kind of become the coordinator here, call my own plays. And it's it's a great experience because you're in a place where nobody's going to really look at that as, as whether or not you can coach or not. You can you can kind of have the freedom to make mistakes and, and try things. And, and it's a great it's a great way to get some responsibility and, and kind of learn by trial without – necessarily some of the repercussions that might happen if you're doing it in the u.s exactly uh, you can you can there's a there's, it's really freeing honestly you can try a lot of different fun things well i think the other thing probably in looking at the example you, you talked about coach Gallardi, i know my players experience and i would imagine yours too that when you're in that position as the player coach and you're thinking about it from both sides you kind of do become focused on what can these guys do best? And I know as coaches, we talk that about that all the time of putting our guys in a place where they can be successful. But it, it seems to me that that would be very poignant in those situations that I got, I got to help these guys succeed because they're looking to me as a mentor. They're looking to me as their teammate, but I'm also their coach. And there's a lot of responsibility in that. Absolutely. In those leagues, too, as I mentioned, you have very limited time, maybe two practices a week, two, maybe three. Guys have jobs. Sometimes they don't always make it to practice. One of those practices or they come late. So there are a lot of challenges, and, it, and sort of by necessity, you have to, to come up with some wrinkles or find ways to teach things or, or do things that maybe you wouldn't do. If, you know, I wouldn't do in my current position in college because I have different guys now that the the range of abilities of those guys you're you're playing with over there overseas is, is wide. It's a vast difference. Like I said, I had a 47 year old and a 17 year old. A couple of guys probably could play college football in the states, and where a couple of guys that had trouble on some high school teams. So you really have to be creative and think about who you have on your team and what can they really do, and try to match those. Try to build that puzzle with some pieces that might not match. So as you left the. The, the playing overseas, playing and coaching, and come back into, I guess, kind of the the mainstream track of being a GA and working your way up to being a, a full-time position coach. What advantages do you feel that experience, even going back to maybe even things you learned from, from playing for Coach Gallardi or Coach Ash, how did all those translate into, I guess, putting you in a position – to to be successful because the GA world is is ultra competitive. I mean, you're essentially mm-hmm. like most guys now. You're probably going to take at least a couple GA positions before you have the opportunity to coach your own position. So anything I guess yeah. that that brings you into it with an advantage beyond just the relationship because that will get you in the door a lot. But once you're there, you have to fend for yourself. So how do you feel those things prepared for you for that? Well, two things. One was when you do coach over there, like I said, anything can happen. It's, it's a totally different environment. So you're kind of ready for, for anything, whether a guy's not showing up or, or hey, my, my, my daughter's sick. I have to take her to the hospital. I can't, I can't be at practice. So you just, you're sort of ready for everything. So when you get to uh, come back to the States, when I came back here, and now I'm in a structured program, where you know guys are going to be there. And, and it almost, in that way, things were a little easier when I came back to the States and it was a GA. Now, the work of a GA is different for sure because you're practicing every day. And, but I was used to that from having played in college. The other advantage I had goes back to something I mentioned earlier, which was 
when you're over there, you're learning how to coach people because the level of the game is, is going to be fairly, I wouldn't say rudimentary, but you're not going to, with only two practices a week and some guys who have different levels of, of ability and experience, you're not going to get too far into the weeds of scheme and things like that. And so, but I learned how to coach personalities and people. And I think as a GA, a lot of times you're worried about getting that initial respect from the players. And I, I thought it, I was able to, do a pretty good job of getting the players to respect me because I was able to respect them and, and treat them as, as, as people, not just players. And that's something, whether that came both from my time overseas and from, from my time with, with John at, at St. John's, because he was, he's a master of that. Honestly, we had 180 guys on the team and he was able to deal with all of us one-on-one personally I can't tell you the number of people that still go back just to visit with him and consider there's 180 guys on a team every year probably some like 50 almost 50 guys per class and so many of those guys go back to visit him he was just a master at at dealing with people coaching people rather than just the game when I talk to to coaches on this podcast uh, uh, one of the questions I ask frequently is about mistakes they made as a young coach and often they'll point to kind of the opposite of what you said that they go in and and they make the mistake of getting so focused on earning respect by showing how much they know and being so involved with the scheme and the X's and O's Mm -hmm. that they, they don't become strong at first in building those relationships. And it seems like through your experiences with, with coach Gallardi and, and your experiences in Europe, you kind of had that going for you that, Maybe that wasn't the biggest concern for you initially. No, and and I knew I didn't. I mean, I, I knew some scheme from being a player, but as a coach to come in there and say I knew scheme. I mean, I took that job initially at, at Delta State in Mississippi to to learn scheme. <laughs> so I knew that wasn't my strong point at that at that time. So the only thing I had to rely on was just my experience with John and my experiences overseas and dealing with with guys and and, and coaching them and there were guys in that program that had been there two, three years that knew the scheme better than I did. Certainly when I first came in. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't, even if I had wanted to try to show off and, and, and my knowledge of football and scheme, I, I couldn't. So <laughs> that was more by necessity than, than, than my, any intelligence on my part. <laughs> I think a, a lot of, of coaching is the, the ability to teach and to, Mm-hmm. really relate to people and understand, like you said, how to coach people, one of the things you've learned in Europe. And so most guys that you talk to who play quarterback usually end up coaching quarterback. You're coaching offensive line. How did you make that transition into coaching the O-line? Yeah, so that, that happened when I went to Delta State. And I actually started with a bit of a relationship with them while I was still coaching in New Zealand, knowing that if I really wanted to get into this profession, if I ever wanted to coordinate, I really need to understand offensive line. So I went into that first GA job wanting to be the offensive line GA, the offensive coordinator there. I said, coach Williams was the first guy who really introduced me to to offensive line play. He's a a great coach. I was lucky that he agreed to let me be the offensive line GA. And then lucky again, when, when he left that coach Bloomgren came in and started the relationship with him back in 2005 and so I always had a, an appreciation and love for offensive line play. And, and I think most quarterbacks say they do <laughs> because they know who's protecting them. But really going into the weeds with those guys and learning the, the nitty gritty of offensive line play, I just, I found it fascinating. Uh, the principles, the biomechanical principles of it. And, and just, it's so different from quarterback and that there are five guys that have to work together. Coaching quarterbacks, I enjoy that too. And I've done that. But coaching one guy compared to coaching five guys at once is, is very different. And it's a different challenge, and I enjoy it. After my time, actually after after Delta State, I, I went to Stanford and an initial stint as a graduate assistant and worked for Tom Freeman and, and John McDonnell there, who were the offensive line coaches under Walt Harris. I learned a little more offensive line, and then I went away and coached Division three football in Iowa. And then, as I mentioned, the Mitchell Military Institute, where I was back at receivers and quarterbacks for four or five years. And then when the opportunity to go back to Stanford and again, back with coach Bloomgren came, it was my chance to get back into the offensive line play. And really he terms it kind of get your PhD in, in football. And that's what it felt like. I, I had been a coordinator and I felt like I knew football pretty well. And then I went to Stanford and 
with Coach Boomer and Coach Shaw in that system and really it was almost like starting over. I understood it, but it was a learning process. And what I know now after those five years compared to what I knew then, I know people say that all the time, but it was it was an advanced degree in football for sure. <laughs> well, you definitely have a lot of respect for all of those guys you mentioned and what they've done and, and the brand of football that they play. Obviously, mm-hmm. now at Rice, you have the opportunity to work for Mike Bloomgren, who's the head coach, and you have your own room there. You're going to develop your unit. As you look at you had the opportunity to work with these guys in the spring, and you have a new group of, of freshmen coming in to join them in the fall. For you, what's the, the main things you're doing in that room and in your position group on the field to really build that unit and bring those guys together into a cohesive unit? Because it's 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 different really than any other position on the field. Those guys, you have to have five guys who are really working together, communicating, are completely on the same page because if, if one le- link in that chain is, is weak, the the whole thing falls apart up front and and then things things don't work. All the other great things you might have in your offense aren't going to come together if those five guys aren't doing their job. So how are you building that unit for you? What's What are some of the pillars that you have in place that, that are going to be the foundation for this? Well, first off, I'm really lucky to be in a place like Rice where you get uh, the type of student athletes that we get, and we had it at Stanford, and it's one of the reasons we were – so anxious and thankful to get this position at Rice because we got spoiled at Stanford teaching some really intelligent guys. And when you teach guys like that, you become spoiled. And we have the same thing here at Rice. So I think one of the things we're doing is, like you mentioned, teaching them or getting them to understand just how important they are and how important that position and that group that they belong to is to the success of the team then you're trying to get them to buy into what you're trying to teach them because what we're trying to teach them is, is different than what they learned before. And you're coming into a situation with a complete overhaul of the coaching staff and style of play. And that takes a little time. And I think that was one of the best things we did in the spring ball was get them to buy into our system that it can work. You can come in and say, look at all the success we had at Stanford, but that's the guy's got to buy in and think it can work for them too. And that's a major hurdle we cleared this spring. I think is belief that our system and our style can work for them. And the rest of it really, it's got to be a little bit organic when you're building that offensive line. They have to come together as a unit. People talk about that offensive line gelling all the time. And a lot of that is organic, and you're just really trying to promote an atmosphere where, where that sort of camaraderie and brotherhood can grow rather than have it be enforced on those guys. And every, I think every offensive line is a little different every from year to year, but from school to school certainly – that that room takes on its own, I guess, should we say, culture. Mm-hmm. And and it's a little bit different everywhere. And, and so we're not trying to force the Stanford model necessarily in that room. Certainly we're teaching a lot of the same things and a lot of the same attitude. But our offensive line room at Rice is going to be different than it was at Stanford because it has to be because they're different guys and it's, a, it's they have to build it themselves. And, and I think my job as a coach is to foster an environment that allows that to happen a part of that is finding leaders in the group and helping them grow into leadership roles, guys that I think have leadership ability. Uh, you can find leaders, but then I think you have to, to help mold them a little bit and put them in positions where they can, sort of like I did when I was overseas, and make, make some mistakes and kind of not put them out totally where they're in charge of the room, but maybe they're in charge of a certain aspect of it. I've, I found a couple guys who I've told I want you to be kind of in charge of this aspect of what we do in, in, in training or in the room or in teaching the, the young guys. And you give them those roles that they can hopefully take the reins and go with and you steer them along the way, but you give them the opportunity to grow as, as leaders and, and teachers in the room and you see what comes of it and what sort of, a lot of times it's a pleasant surprise of what comes out and what type of unit you get. And so I'm anxious to see what type of unit we get. Coach, I love that approach because I really feel like if if you have a team that is just led top down from you and everything has to come from you and the, the learning goes through you, the leadership goes through you, you really miss out on taking advantage of all the skill sets you have of those those people in the room. And I think you, you mentioned that 
they're responsible for certain aspects of it. It really makes the room a lot more interactive than those guys just coming in and watching you go through the film, control the remote, saying this is how we do it, that there becomes that, instead of top-down, that, that, I guess, lateral teaching, peer-to-peer teaching, which sometimes has as much or more effect than just hearing it from the coach. Absolutely, and, and we all know it as coaches that if we have to be the ones, whether it be enforcing discipline or, or doing all the teaching, that the team's only going to go so far that the great teams that happens from within, that happens from player led leadership, right? If, if the players are, are enforcing a standard and doing a lot of the teaching amongst the other players, then you're going to have a really good team. And I, I think that that goes without saying for coaches, but it can also be a really scary thing to give up a little bit of that control. I think that's, you know, I've been guilty of that at times of, of holding onto the reins too tight and trying to be the only voice in the room and, and making sure, I mean, uh, certainly my voice is louder than others in the room, but, but at the same time, that's another great thing I learned from John. He was a master of empowering players. When I played there, all the quarterbacks got to call their own plays. So we got to make up plays at practice, and if, if they worked, John, if they run it again, and if it worked again, shoot, let's give it a name and, and try it again. And that, that's a really cool thing when you can have that freedom as a player. It's really fun for the players, I think. And But but starting a new program, or a new program for us anyway at Rice, as a coaching staff, there's there's that takes time to develop the players being comfortable with that sort of control. Mm-hmm. I'm getting a few looks now like, are you, are you sure you're going to let me do this or do you want me to do this? And, and sometimes you have more confidence in the players than they do. And you're like, yes, go, just go take this role and run with it and see what you can do. And if you need some help, come ask me. But, but the more of that you can do and the more you can get the players to, to lead the team, to enforce the culture and the standard of the team, the much easier job you have as a coach, but a, but a lot, you're going to be a lot better as a team when you allow that to happen, I think. Yeah, it, definitely. I had coach, Jonathan Heimbach on. He's the offensive line coach for the Toronto Argonauts oh, yeah. right now. And sure, he's been down to visit us. He's great. Yeah, Coach Jaime talked about that exact thing of of letting the guys be empowered to do some certain things. I know it was my time in coaching offensive line, I kind of would set up the parameters and the expectations, and it goes back a lot to what you learned from Coach Gallardi that those guys are the ones out there under fire with live bullets under pressure that they need to be able to do some things maybe on their own beyond what you're doing to, to communicate, to put themselves in position to win. And so we would have our initial terminology and calls for the offensive line. And I would always, as, as the coordinator and their line coach be standing up close to the line as they're going through up over the ball and making all their calls. And I could tell you probably about 50% of those calls I didn't recognize because those guys took what we had and then developed a little bit of the language on their own, did some things to disguise. And I told them all the time, I said, yeah, I I don't need to get involved and micromanage that process. As long as it's working for you guys, then, then we'll roll with it. I said, if there becomes problems, then I'll have to get involved. So a lot of the times when you tell them that they, they want to make sure that they're right all the time because that's something they did and they're proud of it. Yeah, and, and it's given the, the guys, I mean, it's just the ability to, to tweak what they call something. I mean, that's that's kind of a starting point, right? That's a, that's a great little thing that they can have ownership over that makes them feel like they're involved, and then you can allow that to, to grow. One thing that I hope to get to, we're not there yet at Rice, but allowing, I, I hope that I'm, I'm getting to the point where my guys can come to the sideline and we're trying to, in the middle of a game, uh, make some adjustments and that my guys can say to me, Coach, this is what's happening out there. I'm having trouble getting up to the second level because of this technique by the nose. And But I think if we do this, this, and this, now that'll work. And, and so I'm trying to give them different tools for their toolbox that, yeah, this might not be how we necessarily teach it, but you also have this tool at your disposal if this happens. And, and I hope if we ever get to that point where I'm starting to get guys coming to the sideline and telling me, hey, this is what's happening. I think if we do this, it'll work, that we're really growing as a unit and getting to the point where I can say like, no, that I don't like that because of this, this, and this, but if they're giving me those suggestions and understanding what we're trying to accomplish, then that's telling me that hopefully get to the point where that's telling me I'm I'm doing a good job of, of not just teaching them the steps and and the calls, but 
how to play football and, and, and how to adjust to a game that's happening in a matter of four seconds and it's violent and it's fast. And, and hopefully I'm doing a really good job of coaching, giving them the two of the handle it on their own rather than having to be a, a bit more of a dictator. Yeah, exactly. When I look at the game today and we talk about it all the time on this podcast, it's funny, probably, Oh, when I started this, let's say a year and a half ago, there was a lot of focus on the concussions and especially the tackle and, and the part that the tackle played in concussions. And I think we've moved beyond that, at least what we see and, and hear about in the media, that the, the group that would like to see football end has moved beyond, oh, it's the, can, the, the big hits, that it's all these sub-concussives and specifically targeting offensive line play. So I know that, especially at, at the upper levels, Utilizing that the hands, especially finding biomechanically a way to link those to the hips, has become really mm-hmm. big at your level, and we've seen it there for a number of years. But it has to filter down to on the high school level because we look at the top level in the NFL. They've instituted a a new rule that kind of penalizes or will penalize those, I guess, head down hits, and we can see those certainly mm-hmm. in offensive line play if you're kind of blindly charging off the line and just a bull in a china shop that there has to be a lot of 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 technique and refining of technique in this that it's when i talk to our subject matter expert on this scott peters he equates this all the time to the skill has to be as refined as it is for a baseball player learning to hit a curveball that it's not just show up in August and do these things that there's things we want to work on with our players year round. So what are some of the things you've started to look at and I guess implement that you really feel is going to make a difference, not just from a safety standpoint, because I think the safety has to be a a byproduct of correct technique, but I guess techniques that performance wise provide more of an opportunity for success. Yeah, well, I think you know I've had the opportunity to, to talk and work a little bit with Scott Peters as well. And I think what's great about what he's doing is is that it is it's good technique. It's not just making the game safer and, and, and taking the head out of everything. Like I mean, that's kind of a, a cute way to to I guess frame it, but that's not really what it is, and that's right. not why I went to visit with him. It's because the tech those techniques work. And even if I maybe don't agree with every technique, I think it's worth my time to go out there and explore and learn and, and see what I like and see what I don't like. And maybe I don't take everything from that, but, but the great thing about a lot of techniques he's teaching is they work. Right. And, and with the added benefit, like you said, that now there's less risk of concussion or head injury bonus. Right. I mean, that's just, that's just good technique, whether it be tackling and I sort of have a unique perspective on the whole concussion thing. Living in New Zealand for three, three years, I became a really big rugby fan. And they're doing a lot of the things we have to do without helmets on, right? So the technique that you're teaching in their contact positions, whether it be in the scrum for those that are rugby fans, or whether it be in tackling, they have to teach that technique to the nth degree. And we have to do the same in our sport because not just for the safety reasons, like you said, but because if you want to be any good, that's how you teach anything. And so that's, that's what I appreciate about what Scott's trying to do is, is it's not about just about safety. That's a great added benefit, but it's about techniques that work, that, that he's used, that other guys have used at the highest level that produce results. And so I'm just, my time was spent with him trying to become a better coach and find things that will work for my guys. And if it makes us safer and keeps my guys in the game longer, great. That's a great added benefit. Coach, you could probably go to any practice around the country focused probably not just on offensive line, but any position you're going to hear probably multiple times in that practice, the directive to use your hips, right? We want to get our right. hips because they're the, the strongest part of the chain. In, mm-hmm. in, I, I know obviously that you talk to Scott and, and he teaches a lot of that and you've been working your way around talking to other coaches for you, how does that translate? What ways are you going to get your players to really learn to engage their hips? And what are some of the, I guess, coaching points in those techniques that you're teaching them to use the, the strongest part of their body, the strongest part of, of the kinetic chain that's involved in the block? Right. And 
you know, we do all the, the typical drills that guys do to try to learn to unlock the hips and use the power from the hips and things like that. But that's one of the things when I went out and I visited with Scott, we spent more time talking about how the hip is involved with all these techniques than we did about the hands. There, certainly hand placement is important and the hands are sort of what translates the power from the hip into the defender's body. But we really spent more time talking about what are we doing with the hip? He and I really focused on pass protection things. And so how do we use our hip to create a better punch? How do we, what does that look like and how does that work? And getting into the fine details of that. So no matter what you're doing at any position in football, but certainly an offensive line, that power has to come through the ground. And the only way to translate the power from the foot into the ground, into the upper body is through the hip, right? Like you said, the kinetic chain. So we talk a lot about that in our room. What are we trying to do with our, with our hip, whether it be in run blocking, when does that, when does that hip fire and how much? I think a lot of times you talk about firing the hips, and, but you see a lot of times guys getting on their toes and their hips are completely fired out and now they have no power, right? You can't squat anymore when you're completely locked out like that. So right. where's that sweet spot of unlocking the hip and translating power through without completely draining your power early so that you can continue to, to, to strain and, and fight and win your block? All those other things that we talk about, whether it be shoulder contact and never to talk about head contact but shoulder contact or hands contact depending on the block and we use both i'm a believer in both in different situations they both have merit but it's about those points of contact whatever they are are just the point at which the energy from your lower half gets translated in the defender and so we talk about that what we're doing with our hips and our legs and how we brace the punch and things like that all the time and and, and scott has great ways to t- t- teach and help guys feel that that was a big thing I, I got from him was a progression of, all right, put your hand here, engage this hip. Now let them feel what this feels like when you walk into them, when you knock their hand down, when you do this. So they get, that's the biggest thing and the biggest challenge as a coach is I can tell guys how it should, should be, but they have to be able to feel that. Well, what's the best way or what's the best drill? What's the best medium for me to, to get them to create feel in what they're doing? Because if they can explain it to me, that's great. But now they have to feel it and understand it kinesthetically. I know for me that as an offensive line coach, I was always looking for the drills that best create that feel. And Mm -hmm. when you're constructing a practice, especially as the year moves on and maybe individual time is is taken from you as practice time is cut down, um, you kind of have to have those those things that, okay, this best helps us to create that muscle memory to engage the hip. For you, what, what would be that, that one drill that if you were, were saying Ooh. to any coach around the, the, the country, coach, this is the, the best thing maybe to create that feel for your players to see what it's like to unlock their hips and, and to bring those into the block? Boy, I'm still looking for that, that ultimate drill. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, the, the two ones, and, and this one's kind of old school, but the old four-point or six-point explosion, just understanding that, that how much power you can generate with your hips, right? That's that's still a great first day, first, second day teaching tool. And I know some guys do it every day, but as you said, as you get more into the season, you have less and less time for individual. That's a great way to initially teach it. I think another one we do is one I got from Coach Bloom, and, he just, and I'm not sure where he got it. He just calls it the strain drill. And it's a basic fit and drive drill where I'm going to sit up on the defender and I'm going to drive block him. But what we do then is we have the one defender standing there and then there's a guy behind him holding the back of his shoulder pad plate Mm -hmm. and giving extra resistance. So now you're trying to overcome the resistance of two bodies and you cannot move that guy and, and without unlocking those hips and bringing that power through the ground, through the hips into the two men. And so it's really basic. You're going to have one guy in the fit position. You're going to have the defender standing there resisting, but then there's another defender behind him grabbing that, that back of his, his shoulder pads and really the one giving the resistance. And, and we call it strange drill for a reason. You'll see guys really peter out in the first couple of steps. Like you don't know if they're going to get it started and they have to kind of really drop and re-engage those hips to get it moving. Mm-hmm. And they really get to feel what it's like to strain and the the necessity of unlocking those hips and getting power out of that that posterior chain. So I hope I hope I've explained that drill well enough. It's fairly simple, but yeah. just adding that extra resistance really just 
boy, they, they can't, they have to unlock and use those hits or nothing's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> They're no, going to stall absolutely. out. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that gr- that's great. It makes a lot of sense too. that added resistance. And yeah, right. you certainly, when you think about, yeah, especially at the high school level, I mean, you might have that 275, 280 pound stud who's a division one recruit, but you probably also have that 180 pound kid right. with them. And so you got to find ways to add, add, add some <laughs> resistance to it. I think that's a great one to teach. And yeah. So coach, coach Bloomgren comes to you and said, coach Ashfield, I'm going to let you call one play. What's the play you're going to call right now? <laughs> oh, if you can't, I'll be honest with you. If you can't, we said, I'm let you call one play. I, I, <laughs> I know he, his, you have to understand his, my relationship, but that, that's a loaded question from him. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think everybody knows that what we've done at, at Stanford and, and, and what we're going to continue to try to do at Rice and, and that's run our gas game yep. play. So we like to run the gas game power with an extra wing off the edge. That's a big play for us. I don't think that's any secret. So I'm going to pick two plays. It's either that one on a 22 personnel or it's going to be our, our weak lead inside zone also out of 22 personnel where we're going to get an extra blocker up to the free safety on the weak side. Those have been bread and butter plays for us for years. And I, if, if he asks me what play I want to call, and I call either one of those two, I don't think there's going to be any arguments on his end. <laughs> but we're going to feel good about those plays no matter what. So those those are those are our staples. That's what we're going to run. If when 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 the all else fails and, and we're looking for a call, we feel that those two plays have great answers to movement, handle secondary support very well, and and forced. In this age where the spread offense is sort of ubiquitous, it forces defense and, and people to fit gaps that they're not used to fitting, and we feel that's an advantage for us. The wing on that, I think, is is definitely something that gives you a, a distinct advantage. Why do you guys like the wing on that gap scheme? Well, it gives us a, a way to account for the inside linebacker with the wing, and now what you're doing is you're forcing a, a secondary defender, a third-level defender, really, to fit C gap, right? Or to, to fit a, a true run gap. He's not just a support player anymore. That's not something that they're used to doing. That's not something that Ted's typically good at doing. And what it also allows you to do when you, you get the right look, that wing can, can just crush that edge down. And those that have watched Stanford play in the last few years have seen this line up guys sometimes weighing as big as 320 pounds at that wing. And when you have that sort of mass, Sir Isaac Newton's laws of physics work in your favor. You can really crush that crush that edge down and really create that alley between the, the down block and the kick out and for your, your puller to get through. And, and a lot of times that puller, again, a, a big guy is, is going to be pulling on a, a skinny guy. Mm-hmm. And we like, we like to put physics in our favor. Right. <laughs> so that's what we do. You're creating that extra gap and, and making a guy who's not used to fitting actual gaps fit a gap. And it's been a, it's been a, a dynamite play for us for a long time. Coach, you've, you've highlighted a lot of great things that you do, a lot of great things that you've learned from your experiences. But if I were to say, what's the one thing that's really going to give you, your unit, the Rice Owls, the winning edge this season, what would that be? Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. I'm still looking for that. What I, what I hope it is is what I talked about before is, is being that we work with, with such an intelligent kids at Rice and – and if I can do a good job giving them the tools to find answers for themselves, it's, it's the winning edge is going to be letting our smart guys use the tools that we give them. And that's giving them enough of a toolbox, letting, giving them ownership of a lot of what they do and letting them come to me with solutions. So it's not just one coach out there. You, you talked about it before that if there's just one coach in the room, that's not enough. Giving, giving guys ownership and the ability to, to be almost, a group of, of coaches, so to speak. That that I think is any program the winning edge. That's that's what gave John Gallardi the winning edge at St. John's for shoot well over something like sixty years. Is empowering players and allowing them and like putting giving them enough tools to allow them to create answers and adjustments on their own. Coach, I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the podcast. Our listeners, you can follow them out there on Twitter at Joe Ashfield. Coach, it was a great conversation. Thank you for taking the time, especially now during your vacation time. I really appreciate that and all the ideas you shared here today. 
No, I appreciate it, Keith. Thanks. I hope the coaches out there found it helpful and appreciate what you're doing for the game of football. Thank you again for listening to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Please, if you are enjoying the podcast, head over to iTunes or Spotify and click five star for a rate. If you have a minute, write a review. It really helps the podcast. Check out our new home for the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. That's at coachandcoordinator.com. And follow me on Twitter at Coach K. Grabowski.